In this section of locational marginal pricing, we're going to consider nonlinear system constraints. We'll generalize the system constraints to gx is equal to zero and hx is less than or equal to zero, where in general g and h could be nonlinear. The economic dispatch problem is now minimize my our objective over the nonlinear, potentially nonlinear system equality and inequality constraints. Gx equal to zero, hx less than or equal to zero. We'll, we will still continue to assume that our generator constraints are linear. So as always, let's start with a minimizer. Let's suppose that x star is a minimizer of the economic dispatch problem and that it is a regular point of the constraints Gx equal to zero and hx less than or equal to zero. Under those assumptions, we can find Lagrange multipliers, lambda star, mu star, on the system equality constraints, and mu underline k star, mu overline k star, on the generator constraints that uh, verify the first order necessary conditions. As previously, we've got a first set of conditions that involve the gradient, then a term dg by dx k transpose lambda star, dh by dx k transpose mu star, they're the system equality and inequality constraints, similar terms involving the generator inequality constraints, then complementary slackness on the system inequality constraints, complementary slackness on the generator constraints, the nonlinear equality and inequality constraints themselves, the linear gener generator constraints, and then the Lagrange multipliers, non-negativity on the Lagrange multipliers on the inequality constraints. As previously, capital mu is a matrix whose entries has uh, whose diagonal entries are the corresponding entries of the vector lowercase mu so to find the pricing rule if we look at the first order necessary conditions i hope it's uh, fairly clear that dg by dxk and dh by dxk evaluated at x star the minimizer they have the same roles as the corresponding columns a, k, and c, k in our previous formulation. And that suggests prices pi, x, k paid to the generators that would be defined by pi, x, k is equal to minus dg by dx, k transpose lambda star minus dh by dx, k transpose mu star. And prices paid to the demand, paid by the demand, I should say, defined by minus pi, k, x, naught. So that's the price paid by demand given by dg by dx naught transpose lambda star plus dh by dx naught transpose mu star. In a previous video, I had a typo there. It should have been minus pi is the price paid by demand. So if we compare the first order conditions for profit maximization for the generator k equal 1 through np, remember I typically use a double star notation for that profit maximization problem and also for the demand to the conditions for the ISO economic dispatch, they confirm that these prices will induce behavior that's consistent with economic dispatch. So uh, unlike the case of linear constraints, however, the nonlinear system constraints will generally necessitate an uplift or generate a surplus, even though the right-hand side, so to speak, of our nonlinear equality and inequality constraints were nominally zero. So let's set that down in a theorem. Let's suppose lambda star and mu star are the Lagrange multipliers on the system equality and inequality constraints for the nonlinear offer-based economic dispatch problem. We'll continue to assume that demand is explicitly represented as part of the decision vector. Our problem is to minimize over the choices of decisions, f of x, the sum of the costs, subject to system equality constraints, system inequality constraints, and we could write out the linear generator inequality constraints explicitly. The prices paid to the generators are pi xk equal to minus dg by dxk evaluated x star transpose lambda star minus dh by dxk evaluated at x star transpose mu star. We define the prices paid by the demand to be minus pi as the price dg by dx naught transpose lambda star plus dh by dx naught mu star. Under those circumstances, if the fk are strictly convex, then we find that there is a unique profit maximizing solution 
of the profit maximizing problem for generator k, generators k equal 1 through np and the demand k equals 0 and that that profit maximizing solution is indeed equal to the ISO solution, the ISO minimum cost dispatch. If the FK are convex but not strictly convex then there can be multiple maximizers but there is certainly a profit maximizer XK double star that is consistent with optimal ISO dispatch. Furthermore the uplift or the surplus is equal to lambda, trans, lambda star transpose times G minus dG by dx plus mu star transpose H minus dH by dx. We can also write that as minus lambda transpose dG by dx minus mu star transpose dH by dx. How do we prove that? Well the incentive simply f f follows from the previous discussion. The uplift is equal to the total payment to the generators minus the payment to the demand which is the sum from k equals 0 to np of pi xk transpose xk star. Notice that that's equal to the payment to the generators which is the sum from k equals 1 to np of pi xk transpose xk star minus the payment to demand which is minus minus pi k star pi k transpose xk star which adds in the term pi k zero transpose x zero adding those up yields the first line on the right hand side there reassemble uh, rearranging it taking the transpose of the gdx and the transpose of the outer square bracket gives me minus lambda star transpose dg by dx minus mu star transpose the h by dx times xk star then adding up those terms for each k enables us to reassemble dg by dx k times xk summed over each k into a term that is dg by dx times x star similarly for summing the h by dx k times xk across the k's well this is precisely the second term and that is by a simple step equal to the first term. So to write it out we've got here is the second term in the statement of the proof we can add and subtract terms here notice that I've got dg by uh, lambda transpose dg by dx that's this term here I can add gx and subtract gx. I can add hx and subtract hx here. By complementary slackness what I'll observe is that the terms mu transpose hx is equal to zero and by satisfaction of the equality constraints the term lambda star transpose gx is equal to zero so that enables me to simplify this a little bit and then removing the negative signs, turning around the negative signs, we get the first line in the statement of the proof. The first page of the proof showed that we could evaluate the uplift as I showed directly as minus lambda star transpose dg by dx minus mu star transpose dh by dx. However, the form we derived in the first line of the statement of the proof is a little different. In some sense, it's a little more complicated and could be somehow simplified to this. But this second term highlights that it's the nonlinearity of the functions that underlies the uplift. In particular, if g and h were linear, then g of x would equal dg by dx times x. In other words, these terms would be zero. It's the nonlinearity of g that and the nonlinear linearity of h that results in non-zero uplift. And to be clear, affine g and h would result in uplift or surplus as in the previous theorem where we had constraints of the form ax equal b, cx less than or equal to d, which are in that sense affine constraints, although we customarily call them linear constraints, they're more properly described as affine. So what is the role of linearization? The role of linearization and its significance is that the derivatives of the functions g and h that represent the system constraints appear in the pricing rule. 
when we approximate the functional form of a, of a constraint function by neglecting its dependence on a system variable, we're actually approximating its derivative by zero. We're neglecting the corresponding term in the pricing rule. Let me relate that back to some of our previous analysis. In the fixed requirements version of the reserve constraint, where we had a fixed right-hand side for the reserve requirements, we were really pretending, since in fact we need to procure, procure reserves enough to meet the maximum generation, so we were in fact pretending that the required amount of reserves is a constant, independent of the values of generation and, depend, and demand. In other words, independent of the system variables. But the required amount of reserves actually do depend on the amount of generation or the amount of demand or both. So the S sum of SK is greater than or equal to F overlying form of the reserve constraint provides the wrong incentives. It also, by the way, necessitates an uplift. Approximations of the derivatives of functions representing system constraints will therefore distort the incentives away from inducing behavior that's consistent with economic dispatch or induce behavior away from inducing efficient investment. We'll see this in the representation of the transmission constraints as they were represented in the zonal ERCOT market. Let's see an example of non-linear ancillary services, and it'll involve regulation. Regulation is the generation capacity available to provide for short-term deviation of the actual demand from the short-term forecast, in other words, the forecast that's used as input to the dispatch, and also deviation of actual generation from the short-term forecast or short-term schedule or dispatch level. To provide regulation, we need a generator typically, but it could be a demand-side resource as well. It requires an ability to respond to short-term frequency variation and sing signals from an independent system operator. Let's write RK for the regulation provided by generator K. A typical requirement for regulation is to have enough regulating capacity to cope with three times the standard deviation of the difference between the actual demand minus the actual generation that's not participating in regulation. These statistics are calculated for the offer-based economic dispatch market having the finest time resolution, in other words, the real-time market. Most thermal and hydro generation is dispatchable, so the actual mechanical power of thermal and hydro generation closely follows the generation level that's needed, uh, that, that is dispatched, it's asked for in offer-based economic dispatch. If such a generator is actually also providing regulation, of course, it closely is following the dispatch level plus the commands for regulation. Dispatchable generation, therefore, does not contribute to the variation of demand minus generation. So it doesn't contribute to the requirements of re for regulation. It's able to provide regulation, in other words. On the other hand, for non-dispatchable generation, such as wind, there may be, typically there is, differences between the actual generation and the short-term forecast or the short-term schedule that's used in offer-based economic dispatch. A similar thing applies for demand. There'll be a deviation between the actual demand and the short-term forecast of demand. So consequently, when we look at the deviation of actual demand from actual generation, it is due to the non-dispatchable generation and also due to the demand. Short-term variability of wind at one wind farm is typically independent of the short-term variability of wind at another wind farm. And the same idea is for demand. So we could, in principle, think about applying the central limit theorem where we're thinking of adding up the short-term variability due to various short-term variations of wind farms and demand uh, centers. And so, under, it, given the independence, it may be reasonable to suppose that the short-term variance of wind and the short-term variance of demand are simply proportional to the amount of wind produced and to the amount of demand, respectively. And we'll ignore dispatchable wind and dispatchable demand in this context and just assume that however much wind there is, however much demand there is, 
that will contribute to the variability in the sense that the variance, the short-term variance, is proportional to the wind and is proportional to the demand. Indeed, since wind and demand are independent, their variances also add together. So if we wanted to calculate the standard deviation of the short-term actual demand minus short-term actual wind generation, that could be written as sigma, standard deviation, is equal to the square root of the sum of the variances. Variances add because they're independent. Let's model the variance of the demand as being proportional to the demand. So proportional to the demand forecast used in the economic dispatch, D. Let's suppose the constant of proportionality is beta D. And similarly, let's assume that W, the total wind forecast generation, contributes to the variance of the wind production by through a in, proportionally through a constant beta W. We're going to neglect spinning reserve in this formulation and think about the generator decision variables and constraints. It, of course, can be added. Let's assume that the constraints on generation and regulation are of the following form, where we're going to imagine each generator contributes some amount of regulation, Rk, and some uh, generation limit, P, uh, and some generation, Pk. We'll assume upper and lower limits for the generation. This should be Pk underline less than Pk less than Pk overline, upper and lower limits for the regulation, and then a joint constraint on generation plus contribution to regulation must be less than or equal to uh, maximum production, and generation minus regulation must be no more than minimum production. We'll assume that the wind generators, a particular case, have no ability to provide regulation. And furthermore, PK overline, in the case of a wind generator, is a forecast of the maximum capacity production that's possible from the wind farm, given the prevailing wind conditions. So this is quite similar to the case for spinning reserve, except that the offered regulation is assumed to be available for both increasing and decreasing generation compared to PK. I should mention that in ERCOT, regulation offers are separated into both into separate regulation up and regulation down services. So the constraints are therefore slightly different in the ERCOT formulation. Let's assume the generators 1 to NW are wind generators, while generators NW plus 1 to NP are dispatchable. So for generators K equals 1 to NW, RK overline is equal to 0. Total wind is the production from generators 1 to NW. Indeed, that is a forecast. And the total, the standard deviation of the short-term actual demand minus short-term actual wind is given by this expression. Let's consider a requirement that we have enough regulation to cover three standard deviations of the variation of demand minus wind generation. That requirement is cited in several wind integration studies. It's not exactly right in terms of satisfying regulation requirements according to North American Electric Reliability Corporation standards, but we'll uh, adopt it. So uh, we'll require that we have enough regulation to cover three standard deviations of the variation of demand minus wind generation. As with spinning reserve, North American markets cur currently represent regulation as a notionally fixed requirement for regulation. The sum of the regulation requirements is greater than or equal to G over line, where G over line is equal to 3 sigma. If we use that representation, we have a very similar representation to the fixed requirement formulation for spinning reserve. We modeled that and analyzed that back in section 8.12.1.4. We're not going to consider that formulation explicitly. In fact, the purpose of this example is to demonstrate how to consider nonlinear constraints. So we'll consider a formulation that explicitly considers the dependence of the requirements on both the demand and the wind generation. And let me emphasize again that that's not used in practice in North America, but demonstrates the issues with nonlinear constraints and the relation to uplift. So we'll consider system constraints on power balance and regulation. Power balance constraint is that D minus the sum of the generations is equal to zero. This is actually a linear constraint. 
but we can express it in the form as though it were a general nonlinear function by defining g of x to be d minus the sum of generations. On the other hand, the regulation requirement is definitely a nonlinear constraint. It requires that the sum from k equals 1 to np of rk be greater than or equal to 3 times sigma, and remember sigma can be expressed in terms of the demand and the generation. We can express that in the form hx less than or equal to 0 by rearranging it and writing h of x is equal to 3 times the square root of bdd plus bw sum of the generations minus the sum of the regulation contributions. Those equality constraints could also be written in the form ax equal to 0, where a would be a row vector with minus 1s in the places corresponding to the generations pk, and a plus 1 in the place corresponding to the demand, and 0 elsewhere. Notice that we've considered in our nonlinear formulation of the inequality constraint the dependence of the need for regulation on the demand variability, in turn depending on the demand, and the non-dispatchable generation variability, again depending on the non-dispatchable generation. This formulation is different to the fixed regulation requirement, and as previously we should expect this nonlinear formulation to result in different prices to a formulation that assumed a fixed regulation requirement. Let me emphasize yet again that ERCOT, uh, in fact, and, mo and all North American uh, markets use a fixed regulation requirement currently. So we're going to consider the offer-based regulation constrained economic dispatch problem. We'll assume that x star is a minimizer. We'll let lambda star and mu star be the Lagrange multipliers on the equality and inequality constraints, respectively. The demand would pay in total based on their price. Price is minus pi x naught, that vector of prices, transpose multiplied into the demand. That gives us this expression, which is equal to lambda star plus dh by dx naught, which turns out to be this expression, times mu star times d. So how to interpret it? Demand pays for energy. That's the lambda star term. It pays for regulation. That's the term that's proportional to mu star. The payment is based on its marginal contribution to the, uh, towards the need for regulation as based on the offered cost of providing regulation. The dispatchable generation is paid based on prices times its production, production of energy and its contribution of reserves. That results in a payment lambda star pk, PK plus mu star rk. That is to say, dispatchable generation is paid for energy and its regulation contribution. On the other hand, non-dispatchable generation, the other generators from uh, should be 1 to nw. It says nw plus 1 to n, but it should be n, uh, it should be 1 to nw. They're paid at price times xk, where now they're pay they're having to pay based on their marginal contribution to the need for regulation. That results in a payment lambda star times pk minus a term that's proportional to mu star and represents the way in which their generation contributes to the need for regulation. Because the power balance constraint is linear of the form ax equal to zero, there's no uplift for energy. However, the sum of the payments for regulation by demand and by non-dispatchable generation now doesn't equal the payment for regulation to the dispatchable generation. There's still a need for uplift because of the non-convexity of the nonlinear system inequality constraint. However, the uplift is smaller than if we had a fixed regulation requirement. On the other hand, if we had a convex nonlinear system inequality constraint, that would result in a surplus accruing to the ISO. You might think about what the prices would be if we had a fixed value G, 
and what the uplift would be. In formulating the constraints, we should consider what is being represented. Is it a physical law that cannot be broken, such as Kirchhoff's laws? Should it be a target requirement that could, in principle, be violated? The formulations so far have, have all represented constraints as though the constraints had to be satisfied. Such a constraint is called a hard constraint. But I want to also develop an alternative representation involving what's called a soft constraint that can represent a target that can be violated under some circumstances. So let's look at that in the context of reserves. Market processes can deal with some randomness. So for example, real market, real-time markets deal with the deviation of actual load from, day, from the day ahead specification by setting a real-time price that's payable on deviations from day ahead positions. The greater the participation of price responsive supply and demand in the real-time market, the more randomness that can be accommodated by adjustments in the real-time market by responses to prices. However, because we need to match supply and demand continuously, and because there can be random failures occurring any time, market processes cannot deal directly with all the random randomness in sufficient time to ensure security. This is the motivation for why we have reserves and other ancillary services. They're required for supply and demand fluctuations, mostly for supply uh, fluctuations, that occur too fast for the market to respond. For example, a forced outage of a generator, wind dial, and in the case of regulation, to cope with demand and generation fluctuations. The formulations so far have all involved hard constraints. For example, the spinning reserve was required to meet or exceed a specific level or specific requirement in terms of other generation levels. Same for regulation. Spinning reserve requirement is an example of a security constraint. It's enforced so that at each time we have enough spinning reserve so that we'll not get into an operating state that could lead to cascading outages. However, reserve above the minimum needed to cope with all single contingencies and potentially to cope with common mode double contingencies has a role in assuring adequacy. Adequacy is, by definition, avoiding curtailment of load, making sure that we can supply almost all the time all of the demand that is requested. And in that context, since we're not requiring it to occur, occur all the time, but just a, a large enough fraction of the time, or to reduce curtailments to a small enough fraction of time, hard constraints may not be appropriate representation in these cases for representing, for example, adequacy reserve. So in this case, soft constraints may be more appropriate. And soft constraints are appropriate when there is some flexibility in meeting the constraint or where there is, in fact, an implicit trade-off between meeting the constraint and the finite cost or perhaps the expected cost of not meeting the constraint. So let me give you some examples. If we have some constraints that instantiate rules of thumb, not something that's derived from physical laws, but something that is based on some rule of thumb. Another example would be an adequacy constraint, where we want to reduce to some acceptable level the probability of needing to curtail demand in order to maintain security. So how would we represent soft constraints? The basic idea is that we relax the constraint by allowing violation of it at some assumed penalty cost. That penalty cost could vary with the level of violation of the constraint. In practice, even hard constraints are represented in software implementations as soft constraints using a very high penalty cost for violation. In other words, Notionally, hard constraints are actually soft constraints with very high penalty costs. The reason for doing this is to ensure that the software will be able to find a solution, I've written in quotes, feasible, because clearly it might violate a particular constraint, but in the context of economic dispatch, we want to have some dispatch schedule. We don't want to just give up, 
we might be very occasionally prepared to violate a constraint so long as we've got a, a, sol a quote, solution to the problem. Since different types of constraints have different importance, the penalties are different for different types of constraints. That will tend to encourage a, p a particular order of violation of the constraints. However, these magnitudes of these penalties actually vary quite widely between ISOs. So let's consider reserve for adequacy and assume that we procure an amount of adequacy reserve specified by F overline adequacy. The corresponding hard constraint would be the sum of the adequacy reserves is greater than or equal to F overline adequacy where I'll write SK adequacy to be the contribution to adequacy reserve by the kth generator. This type of reserve would be, in, a, in, a, in addition to the spinning reserve discussed earlier, we'll ignore spinning reserve for now, and the typical requirements of the reserve could be deployed within approximately 30 minutes. So it could either be in-service capacity, could even be capacity that could have otherwise been used for spinning reserve but was not required for spinning reserve, or it could even be out of service capacity that could be committed, brought into service that is, and dispatched within 30 minutes. We need to recognize that violating this requirement for adequacy reserve does not necessarily lead to an immediate violation of security. So instead of making that hard constraint, instead of representing the constraint as hard, what we're going to do is add an extra variable, I'll call it S0 adequacy, which represents the shortfall of adequacy reserve. We'll modify the constraint. Now we'll add up the adequacy contributions, including S0 adequacy, and we'll require it to be greater than F overline adequacy. We'll include a non-negativity requirement on S0 adequacy, and we'll add a penalty term to the objective, F0 adequacy of S0 adequacy. If I don't violate my adequacy requirement, then I can make S0 adequacy zero, and we'll make the cost associated with that zero. The penalty term could be linear in S0 adequacy. That implies a fixed marginal penalty for each unit of violation. So a function could be of the form C0 adequacy times S0 adequacy. Alternatively, it could be a nonlinear or even a piecewise linear function with a higher marginal penalty, for example, for greater violations. Solving the penalty formulation may result in the original hard adequacy reserve constraint being violated. That would mean that S0 adequacy star would be strictly greater than zero, and the, the Lagrange multiplier on the reserve constraint would be equal to C0 adequacy in the linear case. In the case of a nonlinear penalty function, it would be the derivative of that penalty of function evaluated at S0 adequacy star, in other words, the solution of the economic dispatch problem. The penalty cost or the derivative would be reflected in the prices of all the commodities. Uh, in some markets, a so-called decontamination procedure is used to remove the effects of that penalty. The actually procured adequacy reserve is given by what we wanted, F overline adequacy, minus the shortfall, S0 adequacy. So we can write F adequacy is the actually preferred reserve. It's equal to, actually procured adequacy reserve is equal to F overline adequacy minus S0 adequacy. And we can even think of F adequacy as the demand for adequacy reserve. If we use this interpretation, we can view the soft adequacy reserve constraint as being equivalent to a supply-demand constraint between the procured adequacy reserve on the one hand and the demand for adequacy together with a benefit for adequacy. And that benefit, as always, is minus the costs. So as usual, offer-based economic dispatch would involve minimizing costs minus benefits where the benefits are due to the adequacy reserve and are there and are equal to minus these this penalty cost. In the case of a linear function F0 adequacy, we need to think about how we choose C0 adequacy. Of course, we also need to think about it for a nonlinear function. It's somehow a compromise. We'd like C0 adequacy to be larger than the highest offer price for adequacy reserve. This means that whenever there's enough adequacy reserve available in the market, it'll actually be procured, 
On the other hand, we don't want the penalty too large because if it is, it will produce unreasonably high commodity prices. In fact, CNO adequacy should be a proxy to the cost of violating the constraint. So let me observe that using a penalty for violation of a soft constraint is effectively transforming the constraint into a term in the objective. It's very similar to dualizing the constraint. And as I mentioned, this approach is actually also used in practice even for hard constraints, but with very high penalties. Well, why don't we try to think about uh, evaluating a proxy to the cost of violating an adequate adequacy constraint. So we need to ask, what is the cost, in other words, the reduction in surplus, of violating an adequacy reserve constraint? This cost is due to the increase in the probability that involuntarily, involuntary curtailment will be necessary to maintain security. The change in surplus due to involuntary curtailment is equal to the difference between the value of the lost load that we had to curtail minus the savings from not generating. However, generally, the savings from not generating are a pretty small fraction of the value of lost load. So this cost is going to be value of lost load times the expected energy curtailment. How would we calculate the expected energy curtail? We need to know the outage probabilities of each in-service generator, which will require us to specify the conditions for load curtailment. Uh, the conditions where we were going to curtail load, the supply conditions at that time, and also requires us to specify the conditions under which we curtail load. Let's sketch an approximation to this analysis and it'll lead to a reformulation of the adequacy reserve constraint as a demand bid for adequacy reserve. So let's think about what happens if a generator providing energy trips. We'll deploy spinning reserves. It will, the generators providing spinning reserves will bring up their production over a 10-minute period. But if that's deployed, if we've deployed some generators to provide spinning reserve, then we don't have that spinning reserve anymore. So in either the case that we deploy the spinning reserve or indeed a generator providing spinning reserve trips, we no longer have the spinning reserve that we need to cope with the next generation. So what happens under those circumstances? Other reserve is deployed to allow the restoration of the spinning reserve in order that it'll be available again to provide for security with respect to the next generator trip. Since the other reserve will take some time to deploy, the system is actually during this period not necessarily secure to an additional contingency. But the implicit assumption is that multiple outages will not occur in rapid succession. Nevertheless, there's some risk to security. So the other reserve that we've got in the background that we are going to deploy in order to be able to back off the spinning reserve so that the spinning reserve will again be deployable. The other reserve has a, has a role in providing adequacy. It ensures a low probability of the need to curtail demand to maintain security. How much outage of generation could we withstand in a pricing interval of length t, say, before we had to curtail the load to preserve security? Well, it would be until the total outage capacity, P outage overline, exceeds the amount of reserves that was being procured for adequacy. Because once the outage capacity is more than the reserves that we procured, we now have no more reserves less left to be providing adequacy, we're in fact going to start needing to either deploy the reserves or to curtail load. So we're still focusing on a, on a particular dispatch interval, although I'll mention a, a little twist on that in a moment. The probability of curtailment being necessary in any given interval of length t is the probability that the total outage capacity in that interval, P outage overline, exceeds the amount of reserve that was procured. That's, we'll, we've called that F adequacy. That's going to be our demand for adequacy reserve. 
The probability of curtailment is the probability that the amount that we've procured is greater than the adequacy, excuse me, the, the probability of curtailment is equal to the probability that the outage capacity is greater than or equal to the procured adequacy reserve. This distribution depends on the outage characteristics of generators, the total in-service capacity, the length of T, and other system conditions. It's typically a discrete or mixed random variable. The resulting amount of curtail power is equal to the following expression. We can't curtail any more than D, so it's the minimum of D and the possible amounts that can be curtailed. It has to be at least zero. In fact, the amount of curtail load will most often be zero. And whenever the outage capacity is greater than the procured adequacy reserve, we will have to curtail an amount of demand equal to this difference in order to bring back enough reserves so that we can be secure with respect to a contingency. So the rationale here is we cannot curtail more than D. We have to curtail at least zero, and we only curtail to ma maintain security meaning we only curtail if the amount of outage capacity equal is, exceeds the amount of adequacy reserve. In general, once curtailed, the load cannot be restored to service until some time has elapsed, even if the supply becomes adequate again. So let the load curtailment time be tau times t, where tau is the number of dispatch intervals of curtailment. Typically, we'd expect tau bigger than 1. For example, if we had a 5-minute pricing and dispatch interval and the minimum curtailment is 30 minutes long, then tau would be 6. 6 times 5 is 30. So the idea here, and it's important to understand, is that the effect of curtailment is being magnified by this length of curtailment minimum time. So what about the outage capacity? In some cases, the probability, outage, probability distribution of the outage capacity can be approximated by an exponential distribution. Those parameters of the exponential distribution may depend only weakly on the system conditions. So here's a possibility. The probability that P outage overline is greater than or equal to Y is approximately equal to A naught times E to the minus Y over M. This is true for Y greater than zero. A0 and M depend only weakly on the system conditions. They do depend on T. And furthermore, A0 is the probability of occurrence of an outage. It's typically much smaller than 1. In ERCOT, for example, the forced outage rate is about once per two days. So the probability of an outage in an interval of length 5 minutes is approximately 0.0017. The probability density function of the, of the amount of outage capacity is given by A0 divided by M times X of minus Y over M. So the expected curtailed power is the expectation of the curtailed amount. It's the expectation of this function. I can evaluate that by integrating over possible values of F of P outage corresponding to uh, possible, value, possible values of p-outage, and I need to consider the density function. And as usual, the formula for expectation is an integral over possible values of the random variable. I'll write y as the dummy variable of corresponding to the outage capacity of the expression multiplied by the density. Since I have the minimum of D and the, and, the, and the max of minimum of D and the max of zero and P outage minus F adequacy, I can evaluate that by integrating from Y equals F adequacy onwards. That ensures that Y minus F adequacy is at, is, is at least zero for the terms that I consider that enforces the max of zero and P outage minus F adequacy, but then I'll only integrate up to D plus F adequacy, which will have the effect that I will uh, outage no more than demand 
D. So uh, then, uh, integrating that, I get these terms. And integrating by parts, I get this expression. And now let's try to evaluate the cost. Let's recall that the expected cost of curtailment associated with a level of adequacy reserve is the value of lost load times the expected energy curtailed. That's value of lost load times the power times the duration. Now, in our economic dispatch problems, we've always considered costs per unit time. So we need to divide by T to obtain the expected cost per unit time of curtailment. Notice again that this cost is not just energy times a power level, but it's an energy cost, excuse me, value of lost load times a power level. It's not just value of lost load times a power level, but it's amplified by the length of curtailment tau. If we include this cost term or an approximation to it in the dispatch objective, then the ISO will procure enough adequacy reserve to ensure that the probability of curtailment is reduced to an acceptable level, as implied by the value of lost load. If there's price responsive demand, by the way, then the amount of demand may be modulated, reduced, to ensure that there is indeed enough adequacy reserve. Let's reformulate this as a demand bid for adequacy reserve. We can reinterpret our cost as being equivalent to minus the benefits of demand for adequacy reserve. And recall from section 8.8 .8 that a demand bid is the derivative of a corresponding benefit function. So if we take the benefit function, swap its sign, and di differentiate it, in other words, excuse me, take the benefit function and differentiate it, which is to say take minus the cost, the equivalent cost function, and differentiate it, we'll obtain the equivalent demand bid function for adequacy reserve level F adequacy. So plugging that in, we get this expression. If we have a low level of adequacy reserve, in the extreme it would be zero, Notice that the willingness to pay, pay would be tau times value of lost load times this expression times A naught X of minus zero on N. In other words, it would be this expression, which could be a significant fraction of, of value of lost load depending on the other terms. On the other hand, as F adequacy goes to infinity, we'll find that this X minus F adequacy divided by M term drops to zero. So at a high level of adequacy reserve, the willingness to pay would be close to zero. And in between, the willingness to pay would vary depending on the level of adequacy reserve. If we had particular offers for adequacy reserve, SK adequacy, then the amount of procured capacity would depend on the intersection of supply and demand. So typically, the ISO is going to procure both spinning reserve to cope with the immediate effect of a single generator, out, single generator outage, that is to say security, and also adequacy reserve to ensure the probability of curtailment of demand is low. Typically, as we've remarked, the performance requirements for spinning reserve are more restrictive than for adequacy reserve. So adequacy reserve can be provided by non-spinning capacity. I'll call that SK non-spinning that has to be committed, as well as spinning reserve, SK spinning. If we have a spinning reserve requirement of F overline spinning, a fixed requirement, as well as an adequacy reserve requirement, what we're going to do is require that the spinning reserve is at least equal to the requirement, and moreover, that the spinning plus non-spinning Procure, procured non-spinning capacity meets both the non-spinning and, and, and provides for the demand for adequacy. And finally, we'll add a demand bid for the adequacy reserve in the objective. This formulation allows spinning reserve to be used for adequacy. Uh, some early formulations of ancillary services had price reversal, which occurs if spinning reserve was not allowed to be used for adequacy reserves. This might occur if there's plenty of spinning reserve available at a lower offer price than non-spinning reserve. Finally, if we assume that the adequacy reserve is always depleted before there is a shortage of spinning reserve, we can re represent the resulting procurement as a composite demand, demand, demand bid for spinning plus adequacy reserve. That demand bid for 
spinning plus adequacy reserve will have a willingness to pay for spinning reserve that depends on the penalty cost for relaxation of the hard spinning reserve constraint, which is typically constant at the value of lost load up to the required spinning reserve requirement. And then we'll also have a willingness to pay for additional adequacy reserves that will depend on the adequacy reserve and will in general decrease with increasing adequacy reserve. So to check that out, here's the curve. Here's the demand for spinning plus adequacy reserve represented on the horizontal axis. On the vertical axis is the willingness to pay. The hard constraint of the spinning reserve constraint will, re will be, in fact, relaxed by a relaxation penalty at the value of lost load, which I've shown here. However, if there's more reserves available than the minimum needed for the bare minimum needed to support security, then there'll be some willingness to pay for that additional adequacy reserve, but the willingness to pay will drop with increasing reserves. The actual price for reserve and procured amount of adequacy will depend on the intersection of prices for reserves and the demand bid. Remember that the prices for reserves are based on the opportunity cost of using capacity to provide reserves instead of generating energy. ERCOT is considering implementing a demand curve for adequacy reserve, kind of like what I've described, in order in part to encourage new investment. The demand bid can set the price for reserves and implicitly the price for energy to be high during tight supply conditions. I should mention that several other ISOs already have such a demand bid for adequacy reserve. Other ISOs in North America besides ERCOT also have other mechanisms to provide for new investment to meet forecast of future peak load, for example, installed capacity requirements or capacity markets. If we look at the procurement of spinning and adequacy reserve, I'm shown here my demand curve, and here is in a solid upward sloping supply curve when we have significant available capacity. That would intersect at a relatively high amount of procured reserve, relatively low price for the procured reserves. On the other hand, if we had a very much tighter supply, implying that the opportunity costs for providing reserves were much higher, we might find the dashed curve illustrating the supply curve for reserves, and that would in general intersect with the demand curve for reserves at a much higher price, resulting in less procured reserves and a much higher price. So to summarize, in this chapter we considered surplus. We specialized this to the economic dispatch problem. We considered the need for centralized coordination. We investigated offer-based economic dispatch and the incentives. We considered the relationship between uplift and the form of system constraints. We considered nonlinear system constraints and the representation of constraints, including a demand bid for reserves.